experts in this and can talk to you more about it. And I hope you take a little bit of time out of your busy schedules to learn about how Bitcoin can be a force of good and Bitcoin can help you guys be champions of change. So thank you. Yeah, and think about it like uh, a, a, another tool in your toolbox. We're making it possible for you to check your phone to make sure you don't have Pegasus. We're making it possible for you to figure out how to use VPNs, how to use encrypted messaging. We want you to be safe and protected. We also want you to know how to send money back to your, gov back to your country if your government doesn't want you to. We want you to be able to do it regardless of what they think. So get empowered, get educated. Thank you for coming out here. And let's, let's hear it for, for Fode and Jack. Thank you, Ola. Thank you. Are you comfortable? How you doing? I'm, I'm feeling great. Good. good morning, everybody. Good. Good morning. Uh, Oslo, it's, it's uh, truly an honor to be here, a uh, privilege to be able to share uh, this. I'm very excited for this conversation um, and share it with you all. Uh, so as the video alluded to, my name is Jack. I'm the founder of a company called Strike, and I'm accompanied by a dear friend of mine and inspiration to hopefully many more than exist this very second. And, and we're going to discuss that as Fode is the founder of the Bitcoin Developers Academy and Africa's Bitcoin Conference. And so a lot of our discussion is to visit the concept of, of money and understand its importance in the fight for freedom and its ability to enable foundational human rights and human freedoms and maybe the state of money that exists today and alluding to some education and transparency as to where we are and why we are where we are and how it maybe isn't doing much enabling. And I don't, I don't know, I know we discussed backstage and I'm familiar with your story and a lot of the world isn't. And I think the best way to get started in that conversation is allow you to just explain what you've been through your story and uh, your view of money in the world and, and Bitcoin's potential role in advancing that. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, thank you, uh, HRF and uh, Alex Gladstein, for inviting me. I feel very privileged and even to sit next to you. And uh, thank you for having me. So my name is Fode. I'm from Senegal originally. And um, we have a problem with a colonial currency. So in West Africa right now, we have about 15 countries for whom basically France controls, their, controls the currency itself. The money is made by France. It's printed in the south of France. And France actually controls the, econo the econ economic destiny of 15 of these countries. In 94, I left the Senegal to go to college in America. And unfortunately, that very year, that very specific year, the CFA got devaluated by 50%. So what, what it means is that overnight, the money that my dad saved for me to go to college was divided by half. The Senegalese people didn't have nothing to say about it. They couldn't vote. It wasn't like the euro. When the euro happened here with the eurozone in, in Europe, people actually were given a choice to either join the, 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 um, the EU and actually have the euro as a currency or keep their own. It's funny actually because a couple of days ago when I got here, I was really surprised to see that Norway actually have the Norway crown. They don't have the euro itself, right? And I thought about it, I was like, how come actually Norway is not really part of the EU? How do they have their own currency? Because they are free and they have a choice to basically either join this currency or have or keep, or keep their own pretty much, right? So this morning, as I was sitting in the crowd and I heard about Karin's story from, uh, um, uh, from Rwanda, Filmu, I was so touched, Filmon from Touchman, uh, from Eritrea, and I said to myself, how can we have like, like happier stories in Africa, right? Right now we have this very brutal 
and very uh, rigid um, like uh, governments, basically. So I want to have like a happier story about Africa. But unfortunately, this money itself, right, is actually what's maintaining these dictators in West Africa itself, right? So ultimately, if you want to like really get people to freedom, we somehow, some way have to like really control this money and make sure that this money does not support these dictators that are in power today. And that's what I wanted to share with the public today. Yeah, it's, it's a really important message to try and understand is, is money's role in enabling or disabling very foundational rights uh, and finding a monetary network and a monetary system that acts in the best interest of the people and that cannot be manipulated and controlled by a central point of failure, by someone that has whatever malicious intent or interest to act against those that don't deserve that. And I think there's a severe lack of education, especially in the more developed and privileged world, um, that our money works, more or less. Um, and it's very important to not only understand that in majority of the world, not only does their money not, but the power of their money is used violently against them and is held in such concentrated control. And so I actually, listen, uh, I'm not gonna sit up here and be naive about the fact that Bitcoin's a very complicated topic and it's a wide array of differing opinions about Bitcoin. One of the mental models I wanna deploy in this conversation, I'm curious your thoughts, mm -hmm. is thinking of Bitcoin as more of a tool and not a speculative asset. I think one of the more popular ways to think about Bitcoin is a digital version of gold, and I'm sure we've all heard about that. Um, but what I want to try and instill and discuss very quickly is Bitcoin somehow through very complicated engineering and just pure innovation was able to create a monetary network and a monetary asset that carries properties that are very foundational to supporting human rights and disabling authoritarian regimes or dictators, right? And acting in the best interest of the people and the people can rely on Bitcoin because it is uncensorable, unconfiscatable, is truly distributed. And if you think of the, it as a, it is a, a, a digital rock that lives amongst the clouds is how I like to think of it. That's why I like to put it in the slide. It doesn't with, live with under anyone other than the people in a distributed fashion. And using this tool, whether you think Bitcoin is going up or down, or you think to the left's opinion or the right's opinion. It's a very, very important concept to understand that the ability to escrow value digitally, move value at the speed of light for the first time in human history, uh, on your own merit, on your own time, sovereignly, without needing the permission of anybody, especially in the majority of the world, is such a powerful concept. So I'm curious, given the story you just told and the experiences that you've lived through, uh, yeah, like, you know, I know a lot of people where I'm from want to see an ETF. And I, that's, I think, one of the more improper ways to think about it. What do you want to see? What does Bitcoin mean to you? Well, for me, like I said, to me, the most important part, actually, part about Bitcoin is the monetary network itself, right? If you look at the situation in West Africa right now, we said, okay, there are 15 countries for whom, basically, again, France controls their money itself, right? But how do we get away from that? The idea is, like, in the future, are these governments, are they, actually, are these governments going to make the digital money itself? Is it going to be France? Is it going, is it going to be startups, right? The idea is that if these governments are making this, this, this digital money, they're going to print as much as they want, ultimately, right? Yep. So for me, what I want to see is a monetary network that is not controlled by the governments, that is not controlled by the French, and I am able to send money here from, like, like, from, from, from Norway or from America, where I live right now, send money to my mom, and have her basically be able to get this money, cash it on the other side by using basically the Bitcoin network. And the way actually that, that, actually that it works is that, and let's say any company right now that basically implements Bitcoin, I can just take my wallet that's made by a company in the, in the US, send this money to my mom, and she can, on the other side, basically turn this money into mobile money and get the cash in Senegal itself, right? So the idea is that, again, the money is not broken in a, in a, in a, in a developed world. In Norway, in America, money works. We have a way to like really go to a bank really quick, open up a bank account, get a credit card, and get, and get pretty much like all these banking services. Unfortunately, in Africa, banks are pretty much like luxury brands because a bank will never open up a, a, um, open up a branch in the village itself, right? So how do we service these people? Personally, I believe that the future is going to be, the future of banking is going to be Android, most likely an Android device connected to the Bitcoin network itself, right? And we can send value from anywhere in the world, and anybody who basically joins this network 
participates in the network effect of this monetary system itself. That's yeah. what I want to see personally. 100%. And so I'm going to transition to this slide. And uh, just to try and put a little bit more words as, as to what Fode was alluding to, um, here's the power of Bitcoin as a tool. Listen, uh, again, speculative biases aside, take a look at this slide. You can use Bitcoin as an instrument to escrow value anywhere in the, in the planet. It's unconfiscatable, it's uncensorable, it is truly accessible. If you think about similar to the internet's ability to escrow information, Bitcoin has the same properties and the same ca capabilities to escrow value. And so, yes, can it be used as an inflation hedge? Absolutely, absolutely. Can you opt out and opt into a monetary policy? Absolutely. But it is actually also a superior payments network. It's a superior way to have native interoperability and connectivity to transmit value at the speed of light without the permission of anyone, anyone else. And so in this infographic, uh, there's, it's illustrating the ability for someone from the United States, presumably, to initiate a $100 transfer. So my company, for example, but many others, allow you to connect a bank account. You have no idea you're using Bitcoin. No idea. We use it because it's actually just a superior tool to escrow value anywhere in the world. Connect your Chase account and you want to send $100 to Seneca. What the software is allowed to do, you take the $100, you convert it to Bitcoin behind the hood, you're able to escrow value at the speed of light across an ocean, across a border, across different jurisdictions, across different regimes. And then that physical value physical digital bear instrument. How do you digitally move a piece of paper? How do you digitally move a rock? You can't. You can digitally move a physical instrument in Bitcoin and it will land anywhere in the world and then an ability to convert it back into the preference of the receiver. And so in that way, this illustration works if Bitcoin is $10, if Bitcoin's $100,000, if, if no one values Bitcoin other than a penny, we're able to do this and aid towards the fight for freedom, which is why we're here in Oslo, right? And so I think, I don't know if you have any other context here, but it's a mental model that I think is tremendously, tremendously, tremendously important is that Bitcoin is not only for those to hedge uh, the Federal Reserve's uh, CPI metric inflation that gets reported in the United States. It has an enormous, enormous potential to create interconnectivity and network effects globally and empower things that were previously just very simply not possible. Exactly. And for me, what I want to actually add to that again is that these particular countries have a problem because there is not cross-border commerce in West Africa itself, right? If you look at Europe, the EU itself, right, it is so connected. They are doing business like between each other, sending goods from like one border to another itself. In Africa, actually in West Africa, it is not like that specifically, right? So for me, what I want to see is like, how do we connect these 15 countries that are there? And like, again, do we have like actually a startup building this technology? It would take too long. Africa right now cannot wait itself, right? So the idea is like we have a monetary network that works itself. How do we connect to it to pretty much solve the problems that we have today today and Bitcoin works today? And that's why for me, that's why it actually, actually it's interesting. And that's why we can leverage it to have like more cross-border payments and have nations develop together as a matter of fact. Together is the big point. The exactly. way that we talk about Bitcoin internally as a payments company is we, we think of it as the global payment standard for the world. Think of it this way. There's an open, accessible, set of instructions that if you integrate these instructions, you are interconnected with the entire planet to settle value at the speed of light and at no cost. And no one can tell you otherwise and no one can deplatform you from that. And that, and if you wanna use it, you have every right. If you don't, you don't have to. But if you need to, you can. And that is the tremendous property that Bitcoin enables. And there's also one more point I wanna highlight that I think is very important. In a lot of the places that money doesn't work, that we're trying to describe. And a lot of the places that money is not, there, there aren't resources allocated for money to act in the best interest of the citizens that very need it. Bitcoin uniquely, it, it has this property of being open. And it being open, and, and I'm curious your thoughts on this as well, is very important because of the network effects. Mm -hmm. So if someone in Senegal, for example, integrates this payment standard, they also share in the work of the world that's integrating on that payment standard. They also get the benefits that Jack Dorsey and Square and Block also are building on this. And so a potentially under-resourced, deplatformed, lesser privileged part of the planet gets to share in the work and the innovation of the world. And that's why open networks win. Is it, I don't care what over-controlling powers and overreaching that you do, you cannot like freedom prevails and that's why we're here. 
And Bitcoin has that very unique network effect, which I think the progress of a developing nation and their monetary innovation, if they use this open payment standard and get to share in the work of those all over the planet, it truly makes it unstoppable. This is not a project that's going to take 100 years or 50 years or 10 years. I mean, in the last two years, you and I have experienced tremendous change, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, even after that, I would, I would go back to say again, like um, there's a president in Guinea by name of Sekouture. And back in 1958, when he, when actually when they won the freedom from the French, he gave a really, like a really powerful speech to General Charles de Gaulle in France. And what he said basically, if I can quote it properly, he said, we would rather have uh, freedom, sorry, actually, we would rather have actually uh, poverty in freedom rather than riches in slavery itself, right? The problem is that right now, this money is keeping these countries in West Africa basically slaves. That's really what it is, right? So how do we get a technology that France cannot colonize? And to me, that's, really, that's why I'm excited about Bitcoin, and that's why Bitcoin matters to me, I mean, uh, on my day-to-day, on my -day basically, activism, to help these countries connect, connect with each other and get away from France. And I don't have nothing against French people. Si vous êtes français, je suis désolé, je n'ai rien contre les français. But I, uh, I don't have nothing against the French, but I do have a problem with the French, actually, entities that are controlling and putting, basically, these countries under bondage, under financial bondage, and that's what I have a problem with. Yeah, and so I know we both share uh, in this message, and, and one of the reasons, one of the many reasons we're here is to try and promote it, uh, is that, uh, Bitcoin makes the world better. It makes the world better. It's an opt-in system. And if you have a problem with it, don't use it. Um, but don't discourage those that need it and find value in it from using it. And I seriously encourage this group um, to just be curious. If anything, think of Bitcoin as an education vehicle. Because of Bitcoin, I have a PhD in monetary curiosity. Uh, it's true. It's very true. Uh, why does money work the way it does? Why, why do people have outsized control um, to deprive freedom uh, from those that, it's so uncorrelated and unrelated, it's, it's ridiculous. So uh, we think, yeah, we need to make this Bitcoin network that's such a powerful tool um, for many, many reasons, uh, more accessible and more usable, yeah. Exactly, you know, when I, actually when I read the white paper in 20, 2011, I never thought about America actually, I never thought about developing world. What I saw was a tool for Africa to use, actually, to help us get forward. When I'm here, this, when I was this, mo this morning, I was so heavy-hearted when I heard all the stories, man. You know, I said, why can't we just have better stories coming, like, coming out of Africa, right? And the problem actually is that black people all over the world share the same plight. The problem is that we don't have access to financial resources, and especially in Africa itself, right? I'm not saying that actually Bitcoin is perfect, but it works today, and we got to use it today. Yep, 100%. Um, and so the last slide, I, as we'll close it out, um, the company I founded, uh, one of our core thesis is what's highlighted in pink. Um, it's one of the things I, I stand for and dedicate my life to as a man, as an individual, uh, and then also as a business. And so in an effort uh, to make the Bitcoin network uh, more accessible, more usable, more helpful, we've always had a dedication to allocating resources to make that so, not only in our corporate interests, but generally in the people's interest. And so we felt that it was the correct forum uh, to make an announcement of our latest donation in coordination to HRF and donating to a project called BTC Pay Server, which for very quick education, if you look at this slide, BTC Pay Server is on the receiving end. Uh, it allows anyone, it's open source software, it's free forever, it is contributed to and managed by a distributed community and it enables anyone in the world to connect and use this monetary network in a self-sovereign way that cannot be censored, cannot be controlled, cannot be stopped, and for those that need it most. And so we're really proud to work with HRF uh, and contribute to BTC Pay Server. I don't know if you have anything else to add, but- Yeah, I wanna say a good shout out to Ira. I think, I think she's in the crowd and she'll be on a session at 3.15 today. When they had a problem raising money um, for the, uh, against SARS uh, violence in Nigeria, they cut off the bank, actually bank accounts. And IRA is the one who set up the BDC Pay server to receive Bitcoin donations in Nigeria. So I want to give a big shout out. I, I can't see her, but 
she's an, she's an amazing, she's an amazing engineer. She's an amazing engineer, and she basically helped like put this tool together to fight the oppression in Africa itself, man. And it's amazing. No, these are these are the efforts that matter. And think of Bitcoin as the world's global project to build interconnectivity uh, for money. It truly is, and it and it. I believe personally, and hopefully this conversation alludes to this idea that it'll play a tremendous role in the fight for freedom. That's I believe right. that. Absolutely. So yeah, hopefully uh, the takeaway is uh, understand money's role in not only enabling freedom, but also potentially depriving those uh, from freedom. And that uh, Bitcoin, I encourage everyone to just take a peek uh, and contrast it to what exists today. And it, it's a really fun mental exercise, if nothing else. So. It's an honor, man. You're an inspiration. Thanks, Thanks for sharing honor. the stage. Thank That's you. all we got, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. My name is Jawhar Ilham. I am Uyghur. For those of you who are not very familiar with who the Uyghurs are, the Uyghurs are a Turkic ethnic group. We speak the Uyghur language, which is a Turkic language that is unrelated to Mandarin Chinese. We look different from Han Chinese. We dress differently. We eat different kinds of food. We practice different kinds of culture. And most importantly, majority of the Uyghurs are practicing Muslims. The Uyghurs live in the Uyghur region, which is located to west of China. So you may think, oh, I've never met an Uyghur before. Oh, the Uyghur region sounds so, so far away. But here's one right in front of you. And I'm certain right here in this room, there are a number of products have been touched by the hands of the Uyghurs who have worked in conditions that strongly indicate forced labor. Whether it's a camera or the outfits, for example, that white shirt over there or that black suit over there could have been made by Uyghur forced labor. That doesn't sound so good, right? But don't worry, I'm not here to make you feel bad for the outfits you're wearing. What I'm here to say is that we can all work together. We can work together to push companies to make changes. We can ask them to end their complicity in this crisis. For decades, the Chinese government has been implementing repressive policies in the Uyghur region. Due to several instances of violence and unrest, the Chinese government claims all Uyghurs as terrorists and extremists in order to justify their actions. The Chinese government claims that those actions are for countering terrorism and combating religious extremism. But no. There are other considerations underpinning Beijing's intention to seize control over the population and the region. First of all, the Chinese government has a large focus on the Uyghur region because of its geopolitical value. The Uyghur region is full of natural resources, which marks up to over 20% of China's energy reserves, turning the Uyghur region into a national powerhouse. And as you may have heard of, 84% of the cotton production of China is from the Uyghur region, and that is 22% of the global cotton production. 95% of the solar panel relies on one primary material, 
solar grade of polysilicon. And the Uyghur region produces over 45% of the world's solar grade of polysilicon. The Uyghur region is also home to some of the most important elements of the Belt and Road Initiative. China's flagship trade project, BRI, which went into effect in 2013, aims to link Beijing to over 100 countries via railroads, shipping lanes, and gas pipelines, and other infrastructure projects. Because of these natural resources and the advantages of the geopolitical values, plus the ethnic and cultural differences of the Uyghur people, the Chinese government